Welcome to another unboxing. So today we have Rune Master by Riot Mines. So let's take a look at what came in the box. So this just showed up and I uh, pulled the labels off the top here. So let's take a look at how they did it. Oh, so I've got a, <laughs> a packing sheet of a thousand something. So yeah, it looks like they printed uh, <laughs> something they printed and then it became packing material. So I'll have to redeem those uh, next time I'm in Sweden. So this is Riot Mines, a Swedish developer. So this is an old school dungeon crawl that was based on what was first published in 1982 and based on the basic role playing or rune quest system. So the Swedish dragons and demons, their kind of version of Dungeons and Dragons with a different system. Whoa, a more simplified, fun to play uh, rule system. So this is the uh, box set, the Adventurer's Pledge. So everything should be in here. So similar to the uh, the quality of their slip covers for their Trudvang uh, series, they uh, uh, this is a similar kind of glossy, heavy card. Yeah, it's really nice. A really sturdy box. It matches very much the quality of what they've done before with their other games. So Riot Mines got a little bit behind uh, with their production. They had so many Kickstarters that were coming in for different uh, expansion settings for Trudvang. And uh, then also 5e, they were porting a lot of things to 5e. So Rune Masters kind of got pushed back. And I think this is uh, a their answer to, and it seemed very much like that when the Kickstarter came out um, back in, I think, 2018, uh, their answer to uh, Forbidden Lands. So the uh, Free League uh, Forbidden Lands uh, was a box set similar with an old school feel, a lot of old school illustrators. This is actually an Adrian Smith cover, which is yeah, really gorgeous for this set. So let's see what exactly they did inside. They're not, they're not uh, showing you on the back of the box anything about what's in this box set. So let's take a look inside. Yeah, nice, sturdy. Yeah, this is very similar to their slipcases that they produced for their other series. Ah, so we already have a, uh, a clue. Here's some bases for some cardboard mini. So they're doing pawns similar to uh, what Paizo does for their characters. So we have stands for those pawns and then some cards. Oh, wow. And they're not shrink wrap. They're just rubber bands. So we can take a look quickly. So a couple of decks of cards. Oh, what the nice... Yeah, Adrian Smith art on them. And these are a nice kind of matte. You can see they're not super glossy and pretty decent heavy feel. They're, they're coated so that they feel like they're uh, protected well, but not, not crazy thick stock. But there's offensive, neutral, and I'm guessing defensive <laughs> cards in here to be played. And we'll find out in the rule book how these are used. So this was, uh, I guess, released originally 2016, the Swedish version. And so this is our English update to that. So a, a retro kind of old school gaming experience. Oh, so we've got a couple of these. So this may be due to uh, unlocked stretch goals. It looks like we've got two sets of character sheets. Let's open both of these up and see. So nice, yeah, nice old school character sheet, um, like a B5 size. So nice and manageable. So this is a pad, yeah, a pad of sheets. So notes on the back, aligned, aligned exploration sheet on the back. And then here's your character sheets. And as you can see, very uh, similar to a lot of uh, kind of standard role playing. So we've only got the uh, four characteristics though. So kind of four stats, but then also skills and uh, Oh, wound locations as well. Nice. All right, so that was bundled with, oh, here we go, so two adventures. So now we have two pads of character sheets, so that's that's a lot. And yeah, it is a duplicate, so maybe it is a, uh, so two copies of the Whispers of Old Mark, so I don't know if that's a packing mistake if it was part of the, uh, part of the adventurer's pledge, but this looks like a starting adventure. And they're, uh, yeah, just booklet forms 
with everything in there, including those stat lines. So let's take a look at the credits real quick. So Max Hergren, and so this was obviously done for the original. Oh, and then Alvaro Tapia, yeah. So Tapia does a lot of the uh, art for a lot of uh, Riot Mines games, so there'll be some of his wonderful renderings inside as well. So we've got two copies of these. So it's good to have that many character sheets. I don't know if we'll need two copies unless the players need that. Here's another adventure booklet. The Isle of Wrath, of Wraiths. And uh, yeah, very similar content stat lines. And there's more maps in this one, it looks like. Nice. Another deck of cards. And similar, they're heavy coated, but kind of a matte, not glossy. So there's a little detail of that cover illustration. The Great Heirloom Sword, Troll Eyes, Fleet of Foot, Owl's Eyes, Cunning as a Fox, Upside Down, <laughs> Strong as an Ox, Charming as a Snake, Ogre Blood, Great Healing, Strong Back, Ambidextrous, Burglar, Oh, there's one more. Is there one here? No. Learned, adept, learned, I guess, adept, barfly, survivalist, hardened skin, dragonkin, tainted, fearless, natural leader, griffin sense, ufer class, noble birth. These may be just, yeah, character traits that uh, give you bonuses. So I don't know if they're randomly chosen or if you uh, generate these based on, you know, jobs or background or whatever. Great reflexes, superior reflexes, great attacker, superior attacker, <laughs> great defender, and superior defender. Yes, shield master. There's heirloom great shield, heirloom great armor, dodger, marksman, armored, great dodger, Heirloom Shield, Heirloom Armor, Giant Strength, Master Burglar, Reader, Apprentice, Veteran. Interesting. So yeah, just the same detail. So no extra illustrations on the cards, even the item cards. Hardy, Lucky, Font of Magic, and back to Troll Eyes. Yeah, but these are kind of yeah, poker sized set of cards. Oh, and here's our D10s. So it's a percentile system you can see from the D10s. They give you a set. It's nice, I did like a stone kind of finish to these. The uh, example on the uh, Kickstarter page was just, you know, the standard blue with white letters. So I'm glad they did something a little bit more thematic. And what is next? I think it's going to be, what, maps? Yeah, there we go. Nice. And do we have, oh, we have hexes. Yeah, you can see. So in the areas of the stone floor, there's a hex. Oh, let me see if we get that a little closer. As you can see, there's hexes on this map through these tunnels. So hex-based. And then I think, let's see. Oh, here's a larger location. So this is the Queen's Catacombs and the same hexes. So there's more general location and then hexes for positioning. Oh, lots of maps. So these are kind of standard. They don't feel like they're coded to be dry erase friendly, but you can you know, put a clear plastic sheet over them if you actually wanted to write or needed to write or worried about them being damaged. But they're just, yeah, they're just standard coded kind of poster stock. And uh, more map with the uh, hex marks. Oh, here we go. Here's a world map. Cold racks, fill in dark. Oh, let's see if I can get this glare out of here. So there we go. So there's there's hexes, and these hexes are actually notate. Uh, they're actually designated with uh, four-digit numbers, so this will give you much more ways to track travel and things that are happening at specific locations. And one.
one more. A blank one. There we go. So for use for whatever you need. Yeah, so I'm, I'm interested. It's a very small hexes. They're, well, a quarter inch. Half inch, I guess. Yeah, half inch hexes. They're very tiny. So a blank poster as well with the, the kind of distressed finish on there. And here is a booklet. Oh, this looks like it's the, this is the uh, DM screen. Yeah. Here's our screen and here are our pawns. Yeah, I'm curious, I was curious about the uh, uh, quality. Oh, so they're not pre-punched. So they are two-sided, as you can see. They're two-sided, but they're not pre-punched. So you will have to cut them out. So I guess then you can make the decision whether you're just gonna block them off or you're kind of, you know, cut around the characters to give them, you know, different profiles. Let's just take a look at everything. So the illustrations are great. Very uh, well done. So our characters and then monsters. And then, yeah, like I said, two-sided. So it looks to be uh, identical, just flipped. They just mirrored the, the two-sided. So you're going to be facing both ways. <laughs> so there's not a designation. So it's not the back of the character and the front of the character. You'll have to determine what's front-facing, I suppose. But uh, yeah, interesting that they're not punched. They're not pre-punched. And they're they're very glossy. It's a very glossy coat. So these might be a little tricky to cut. They're, you're going to need a, a hobby knife or a decent pair of scissors. But uh, yeah, so this looks like yeah more more characters, and then of course at the bottom more monsters. And this is all monsters. Ah, yeah, these are really well done. And the monsters are getting larger. Harpies and yes, yeah, so a lot of very standard orcs and goblins and griffins and chimera troll looks like. So very similar, uh, very standard fantasy monsters. Another large. There's of course giant spiders, centaur, and a dragon. Of course, a giant and a huge ancient spider. Interesting. So, yeah, I didn't know what to expect with these. These are very different from what I thought they would be. And, and you know, my expectations are kind of based on what Paizo did with their pawns. But it gives you some flexibility. You can cut them however you want if you just want to cut rectangles or uh, get a little, you know, closer to the actual characters themselves. The artwork is great. I'm surprised they're not, there's not too, like a front and a back, just to give you facing. But maybe that's not all that important. And so those were inside the Classic Fantasy Play GM's screen. So more excellent. Yeah, they, they always have really excellent artwork. That's the thing that I'm really a fan of with Riot Minds. So movement, bonuses, and penalties, stances, exploration points, terrain, location, hit locations. Resistance tables, so active and passive resistance. And then critical failures, critical failures in combat and spells and perfect rolls. So I guess they're calling, yeah, criticals and perfect effects and then weapon damage. Let's take a look at just the art side. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Knock over the uh, box. So here is the art so just yeah four different panels and again the cover of the uh the box so not a big panorama uh image but some very thematic art yeah and this is um looks like a b5 so a four panel b5 so it'll sit a little sit a little lower than an a4 so a little bit easier to reach over because you are dealing with pawns but uh not the horizontal kind of landscape versions we've been seeing more recently. These down here. Yeah, so, hmm. I'm not sure about the pawns. We'll have to see how that goes. Just move the maps over here as well. So we've had the card decks, the adventure books, the dice, and this looks like our hardcover. Yes, there we go. So that's it. That's the last item the hardcover rulebook itself. So without the box set, 
I believe you just got the stretch goals and the, the book and the pawns and maps, basically. So um, maybe cards and dice, and of course, then the box itself are the uh, were the bonus of the adventurers pledge. Adventurers and above, I believe, had the uh, had the box itself. Okay, so let's have a look inside. So this is their core book, classic roleplay fantasy. Oh, here's a little text on the back here. So the book in your hands is a gateway to some of the most harrowing wonders of the post cataclysmic world of Rune Masters. Ah, so similar to Forbidden Lands, it's a post kind of post apocalypse. Uh, the world of Rune Master. Enter the world of classic fantasy and old school tabletop gaming adventure in the ruins of the past set out on a treasure hunt in Rune Masters. All right, so here's a little a little color text, a little fiction to give you the flavor. And so Rune Masters is a generic fantasy game setting that can be played in any game system that can be played in any setting. Play classic role-playing adventures or skip the story and go for go all in for some hex-based dungeon crawling, bashing, and treasure hunting. Rune Master includes word, uh, rules for classic fantasy role-play, hex-play, and dungeon crawl. Interesting. They're kind of breaking it up into... Yeah, because there is... Forbidden Lens did give you a setting and uh, you probably didn't have to use it but it was you know there was enough there to kind of you know guide the characters and make them kind of curious for exploration's sake so let's see yeah so nice so not a heavily coated not heavily glossy covered pages actually pretty feel pretty raw like yeah pretty very light on the uh, finish so thanks to all the Kickstarter backers. So yeah, all of the authors. And uh, yeah, so interior art by Alvaro Tapia, Johan Egerkranz, Jesper Elsting, and Evan Amundsen. And layout by Magnus Melnberg. So um, yeah, some of the great artists that have... Uh, and I think maybe in the West or in the English speaking world, we're not as familiar uh, with a lot of these uh, classic artists that did a lot of work uh, from the 80s and 90s for uh, Swedish role play. But it's really good stuff. I love how Riot Minds. Uh... Yeah. For example, yeah, pieces like that that are going to fill the book. So the introduction, the book in your hands is a gateway to the same thing that was on the back. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two kinds of participants, players and the rune master. Ah, so it's an RM. So two to four players is recommended. So play modes, hex mode, uh, two, two types of hex modes, large scale hex mode and detail hex mode. Yeah, like we saw on those uh, maps using tiny hexes to crawl rooms, random encounters, prepared gameplay, Interesting. So I wonder what kind of support, because this is kind of late coming out. This was due out towards the end of 2019 and was delayed. And then, of course, you know, the world fell apart. So everything was pushed way back. So we are uh, now dealing with uh, yeah, a much delayed version of this game. And so I'm curious what kind of uh, support this game is going to get from this point on, or if they think that this is just enough of the rules and what you need so that you can play, you know, with whatever settings, whatever adventures that you'd want to. So we will see, and and we yeah, we'll take a look at the. Uh, uh, oh, we already did kind of have a quick flip through of those those starting adventures. So the dice are d10s, and there's also yeah percentile. So do you're doing d100 rolls, and then there were three d10s, miniatures and grids. So in the hex, the adventures played out on a grid players move their miniatures yeah so interesting because the bases definitely don't fit that miniature that hex that smaller hex miniature scale it's definitely a one inch scale so i'm curious yeah so skill checks attribute checks damage rolls and open rolls critical fails oh here we go this is their uh so, for example, uh, the risk of a PC harming himself or someone else when he rolls a critical fail. So a critical fail would be what? I screw up unexpectedly. You always fail critically if, ooh, if you roll a 98 to a 100. So there's actually three rolls 
uh, of the on the D one hundred. So maybe that's a basic role playing standard, but uh, yeah, that's surprising. There's actually three, and then you roll on the uh, the fail table, the perfect roll. So a one to a three on the D100 is a perfect roll. So the implication of a perfect roll is determined by the RM, and we saw a table of that. The resistance table, there we go. That's what was in the, uh, a smaller version of that was in the DM screen. So here's your uh, yeah passive and active results. So maybe this is generating target numbers for different resistance. Player character, so creating your characters. So the races are elf, human, and dwarf, and the physical attributes are strong, intelligent, uh, and oh, they don't—they're not saying <laughs> the attributes are strong or intelligent, and, uh, and then skills as well. So the playable races are yeah, your basic fantasy races. So your elves, your dwarves, and your humans. There's the attributes, and then you've got. Racial bon the controversial racial bonuses or deductions based on your, uh, and very standard. Yeah, dwarves are more physical, elves are less physical, but more charismatic, and humans are very average. So the attributes physique, mind, intelligence, charisma. So natural healing, leadership bonus, damage bonus. So you have your attributes, and then secondary attributes are your hit points. And then, oh yeah, so yeah, your natural healing ability, your damage bonus, carrying capacity, maximum movement, sword hand and shield hand, actions. Beginning characters with no experience start with only one action. This value can be improved. Personality and background. Name, gender, age, height, weight. All right, so they do make a reference to yeah, gender. So they say man, woman, or a transgender character, the player decides. In terms of age, characters will all be young. But there's yeah no hard or fast rules that forbid them from being older. So personality, appearance, background, starting funds and equipment, social background. So just a simple yeah, D10 social class role, and that determines yeah, starting funds. And then experience points. So yeah, very, very low amounts of experience. So 100 gets you to level 2. So beginner, practiced, expert, master, and legendary. So yeah, they only give you up to level 5. So I think the experience points will be pretty stingy. It's not the thousands that you may be used to. <laughs> so skills base value and skill value and then of course the you know the attribute connected to that skill yeah really great art though that's yeah nice theft illustration so yeah here's burgling knowledge magic melee social survival everything that's connected to experience and death so exploration from hex play so one method for gaining experience or exploration points is for the characters to venture out in hex mode. So exploration points, oh, how many hexes, bordering hexes you can explore. Scenarios and missions from large scale to fine or to fixed hex play. So going from Large scale hex play to playing on out an event in a fixed hex is done primarily through the hostile encounters. The rune master draws up the environment on a map and then puts the adventurers in a place on that map together. So fixed hex encounters cannot award exploration points, uh, cannot more exploration points than the hexagon on the large scale map contains. Oh, I see. So exploration from RPG mode. So Rune Master can also be played as a traditional RPG game. In RPG mode, adventures are measured in exploration points. For the most part, adventures are rewarded for solving tasks as a group rather than individual actions. 
what is reasonable. With all the officially produced and published adventures, it is clearly stated how many exploration points each scenario will be worth and how a rune master should distribute them, including considering the player's various efforts. This is reasonably ultimately determined by the rune master. So for how far you get, I guess the progress that's made in an adventure. To improve hit points, to improve carrying capacity. So these are spends, it looks like, yeah, to spend your exploration points. Improve natural healing, damage bonus. So your sub attributes, your secondary attributes can be improved with exploration points. So yeah, I guess another version of XP. Is that what they said? So here, let's take a quick look at the, when we saw character level, was that actually, <laughs> just a quick look back. No, it's experience level, yeah, experience points. So exploration and experience points are the two economies. Death of a character. Uh, yeah, so just introducing a new character. So there's no, there's no saving throws or anything. They're not talking about death saves. Actually, get to retire instead of dying. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so light rules. They're not, you know, not going too granular, too deep into a lot of these uh, different aspects. So equipment, currency. Weapons, shields, attribute requirements. I see. So the AR is based on the physical attribute. Two separate ARs, AR values. So attribute requirements are ARs. So there may be more than one required. So we'll see that. Yeah, we'll see that in the list of the uh, equipment. Attribute requirements for armor, protection, and movement. So movement penalties. List of equipment. Price in silver or copper. Armor tables, weapon tables. Grip. Grip refers to the weapon is wielded with one or two hands. Damage. Effective range. Yeah, there we go. There's our attribute requirements. Uh, for a shield. Entire sets of armor. And then cost and weight. Yeah, so here's our, yeah, it's too bad. There's not a lot of illustrations for uh, items. That's always nice to reinforce the, the flavor of the setting. So all of our item stats, containers, perpetual containers, master made items, legendary items. So yeah, it seems like they had heirloom and yeah, legendary level, but I haven't seen anything about magic items. So course of action. So combat and damage. So actions. So you have a single action as a uh, a beginner level or a beginner level <laughs> character. That's the one yeah, problem with the translations is sometimes you get some, still get some typos and uh, they may have had to uh, rush things a bit because of yeah things getting behind. So move, oh, so these are your, your actions. Perform any of the following actions. So move, fire, reload, melee, activate magic item. So there are magic items. Switch item or give an order. Use a skill or other actions. And then your stance, combat, defensive, neutral stances. Oh, I see. So you get bonuses. If you're in an offensive stance, you get a plus three to your initiative roll. Neutral is straight. Defensive is a minus three. Minus three to attack, but plus 20 to parry. So initiative rolls. To determine the rotation, all participants will roll their initiative with on 1d10 and add the appropriate modifiers based on their combat stance. For every new initiative check, the players choose which combat stance there they want to assume. Any given signal, all players reveal their chosen stance and roll for initiative. Oh, I see. So that's what the cards. Yeah, the cards are for your your stance that you choose the one of one of three, and you may have improved. I think we saw improved or superior defense or offense. So that may be something you upgrade into. So. Attack and parrying, equipped shield hand, avoid an attack. 
to, to avoid an attack, you must have chosen defensive stance. Yeah, so stances are going to be important. So what what uh, stance you're in is going to l tell you what actions you can do as well as what bonuses or uh, negative factors there are. Uh, successful attacks hit areas. So where an attack lands. Damage. Wow, lots of D10s. Wow, so a light weapon is... Uh, everything is D10 damage. Boof. I hope there's a lot of hit points in this game. At level 1 with 1 action, I don't want to get... I don't want to be hit for 10. 10 points of damage every time. Attack and protection. So protection value is your armor and probably any sort of dodging or defense you naturally have. So for instance, if your character has a natural protection of one, a specific body part. Oh, so that's, oh, so yeah, it'll, so a helmet covers your head, the armor covers your body. So not only is it uh, protective values, but they range just depending on where you, they hit you. So, wow, that's a little more, yeah, a little more targeted, a little more fun to, uh, and I guess you can maybe direct an attack you can say you know where your like attack location like where you're going to be attempting to hit something critical failure unbalanced oh, so if, if fighting the dark surprise attacks so sometimes players may want to ambush aiming their attacks so they get a plus 52 plus 75 modifier on that first attack wounds total hit points so your physique and mind plus a d10 are your hit points so that's not going to be huge is it oh interesting becoming injured so body part points the bodies of all creatures are divided into a set of body parts every part has a certain amount of part points oh so not only yeah so <laughs> so location does make a big difference you're hitting for 10 damage you're going to be able to disable total amount of HP, the body point part of that represents how much damage it can sustain before you're rendered completely unusable or worse, cleaved clean off. Oh, critical injuries. So if you're hit just right in your arm, you lose it. <laughs> oh, man. Becoming injured, registering damage. So all damage taken by a character is to be written down by the player or the rune master as they keep track of the character's health and status. So we saw that on the character sheet as well. Their hit point box is relative to the body part points. Yeah, so yeah, you can take a few, maybe not depending on when they... Here we go, unconsciousness and death. So death... Is a natural part of any campaign. PCs and NPCs die when a character has accrued as much damage points either as they have in total or as a body point in the head or to torso have. They fall unconscious. Unconscious conscience creature won't wake up until they have healed at least one hit point. So that's, yeah, similar. No negative hit points. A creature that accrues more damage points than either they have HP in total or body points in head and torso will succumb to their wounds and die. Unconsciousness occurs when a total amount of damage points is equal to the total number of hit points or the damage to the head or torso equals the total amount of respective body part points. Death occurs when the total amount of damage points exceeds the character's total hit points or the damage of the head or the torso exceeds the total limit of respective body part points. Wow. So the effects of being wounded. So an optional rule is... Injuries naturally hurt and are more severe. And the more severe the injury, the more they're going to hurt, meaning the character is going to be affected by the pain. So they can be represented by giving a penalty to all skills of minus one per hit point loss. Wow. So yeah, you can affect the uh, your your effectiveness as a fighter or to do whatever. Oops, you know, depleted by your health as well. Critical injuries. When a damage to a character's arm or leg exceeds its body part points, it is critically injured and becomes unusable. Someone with a critical injury to an arm can no longer wield a weapon, and it receives a minus 40 penalty to any actions that require the use of both arms. Yeah, so location is yeah definitely uh, 
focus on physical trauma, fall damage, fire damage, internal damage, asphyxia, healing. So natural healing. A character's natural healing rate is based on their physique. Each night during the rest, the character sleeps at least six hours. So kind of a, I guess that's a long rest. Yeah, they regain part of their lost HP, four hit points per night. But the higher their physique, the more they gain. So this is, yeah, the range depending on your stat. Care, if a wound is tended to immediately after being sustained, the injured body part will heal 1d5. Magic healing and drafts. Yeah, so yeah, pretty simple, pretty simple and straightforward. So magic, becoming a wizard, the magic skill, magic and magic points. So we're gaining magic points, spell containers. So yeah, I guess equivalent to the slots. So the magic skill of the character has a chance of learning what a spell container holds. The character's chance of learning how to activate the magic in a spell container, the character's chance to activate a spell container, and how many magic points the character has access to. So that's what your magic skill gives you. So when a character amasses a certain level of magic skill, they receive magic skill points. Oh, so it's not right away. Interesting. Oh, if your magic points are lowered to a negative value, your character dies. Wow, magic is dangerous. <laughs> Spell containers. Ancient spells and magic can be found written within a huge variety of items and objects. Some might be obvious, while others are anything but. In terms of game mechanics, these things imbued with magic are called spell containers. So three kinds, limited, rechargeable, and perpetual. Advanced spell containers, understanding special spell containers, determining if an object is magical and what it does. Uh, here's our bookmark, our ribbon. To activate a spell container, power level, activation, successful roll, perfect roll. So successful roll for a spell, it is activated perfect roll, a 1 to 3 on a d10. So we're going under, it is always activated. And a failed roll, it is limited, it becomes a limited container. Yeah, there's our table for critical failures and perfect rolls for spells. Time and magic, quick spell, moderate spell, slow spell. Common spells, alter object, anti magic is our spell list. Chill or heat, cleanse the creature, commune with animals, commune with the dead, dispense, I'm sorry, disperse, disperse, enchant item, fire burst, flame, fog, frost sphere. Yeah, so very standard RPG type grip. Hand of Death, Heal, Keen, Sighted, or Blindness, Leather Skin, Light or Darkness, Lightning, Mirror Image, Regeneration, Rock Path, Soil Path, Rock Throw, Sight, Silence, Stone Form, Strengthen, Enable, Enfeeble Characters, Telekinesis, Telepathy, tra Traceless, Transparency, Water Path. Wow, so uh, yeah, pretty tiny spell list and a lot of very standard things that you've seen before i didn't see like a fireball or magic missile type thing so i wonder what the kind of default magic attack would be yeah flame i suppose yeah flame burst so large scale hex play since is important an important part of runemaster is discovering every nook and cranny of the murderous <laughs> Murderous Cranny of Calderox. So that's our default setting, is Calderox. The rewards can be huge and the wealth dizzying. So hexes, types of hexes, so cities, farmlands, borderlands, wilderness, mountains, and woodlands. Movement, yeah, so these are their hex crawl rules, events in hexes, transition to detailed hexes, fixed play, random dungeon crawl. Return to Explored Hexes, Exploration Sheet and Terrain, and then Explanation of the Travel Table. 
also, yeah, everything, all the hazards and what will be coming across. Wow, yeah, great, great illustrations. Wandering monsters and treasure. So detailed hexes. So there's movement based on race. Fixed hexes, random dungeon crawl. Yeah, so kind of their three, their three styles of play. That doesn't look like a uh, a human or an elf. <laughs> Exploration, optional features, lighting and visibility, building and narrative. So I think we'll eventually, here's all the tables for large hexes, large scale hexes. Yeah, so to generate, wow, yeah, so so very similar. This is a yeah, very similar, similar aesthetic to Forbidden Lands. It had a lot of tables for generating random encounters and, and what things were. So here's treasures and so it's all D10 tables for levels of treasure, types of NPCs. Ah, what's in a farmland? What's in a marshland? Time for pizza. <laughs> there's a pizza table. <laughs> Just in case there's a little... Uh, I guess when you get tired of crawling those hexes and you need to order a pizza. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Marshland encounters. Mountain encounters. Yeah, so everything from mountains, sealands, highlands, woodlands. Yeah, so all the tables are here. And here's then dungeon crawls. So passageways, stairways, chambers, doors. The hazards and traps, caves, ruins, dra uh, dungeons, and then optional. So types of chambers, furnishings, chamber state, air, and odors. Oh, and here is our monster section. So, yeah, we have all of the, uh, I guess these are, yeah, sizes. So human scale and think that much bigger. So the size of a creature for ease of understanding, a visual reference is provided. So creatures are measured against a standard human comparison. And the image below shows yeah, humans twice the size of humans, three times the size, four times the size, five times the size. So hit points of large creatures are multiplied by size. So there you go. That gives you a, Quick way to generate how many hit points a dragon has. Nice. So trolls. Yeah, and all the ways yeah to generate. Generate everything for a, a random troll, an ogre. Yeah, this is great art. The orcs. Giants, goblins, minotaurs. Undead, specters, whites, skeletons, centaurs, harpies. Yeah, we saw them all on the pawn sheets, all of these uh, monsters. And now we've got a way to generate their stats. Manticore, that was a manticore, not a chimera. Griffin, and our dragon. Dragon's treasure, breath attack, dragon tongue. There's our large... Old dragons, small, young dragons, demons. Ah, that's what that was. A large demon. All right. So yeah, so a limited number of monsters. Yeah, so the scale of everything is, is much more manageable. I mean, it may not go into the kind of details. I mean, it should be as satisfying if everybody has a basic idea of, uh, you know, fantasy role playing and dungeon crawling. It should be satisfying in, in the diversity. There's enough diversity, but it is a limited scale of things. So the adventure, the session. So one of the beauties of the hobby is that the group gets together and plays, each group gets together and plays games differently, just no two hexed map dungeons are the same. So how to create the adventure, come up with a plot, the world. So I guess this, yeah, we're basically starting the uh, the Rune Master section because I don't think the players need to, yeah, 
we need to read through this. Yeah, so they didn't they didn't delineate it, but yeah, this is definitely the beginning of uh, instructions for people running the games, and I think all the tables as well. Like you, you don't need um, the players wouldn't need the uh, the monsters section either. It's funny they usually denote you know, players. You know, here's character creation. Here's everything up to here. A little bit of the lore or the setting. And then the rest is for the Rune Master. So we are definitely in that section now. The world, drawing maps, non-player characters, time, changing the rules, RPG examples. Oh, interesting. So yeah, example of what a first session, a second session would be. And here's our setting a little bit. So Calderox. So yeah, they'll give us the background of the, uh, the cataclysm that we are following after here's our timeline of everything the wool war begins ah oh, these are great yeah there's another wonderful tapia illustration arduous road oh look at that yeah i love his stuff the land the union the new land the union the three wars so yeah, you can use uh, the setting and this lore to give flavor to everything. And it sounds like it's a basic enough uh, rule system that you can yeah, bring anything you want. I would love to try um, doing a little uh, chronopia <laughs> if I could get uh, some translations or at least enough references for the uh, chronopia setting. I'd love to play that as an RPG. And uh, yeah, follow because the setting the setting is spelled out pretty well in the miniatures rules. So you'd have enough of the setting, you would just have to kind of restat things, or you know, go through and uh, come up with some uh, tables to generate, you know, the different monsters and PCs, the marshlands, nature in general, beings and beasts. Yeah, great illustration. This is nice. After last thing we looked at was Dune, and there was not enough illustration in Dune for my taste. I love having so many uh, pages to kind of give you the the setting and flavor visually, as well as all the you know text and and background. So here's the people. So our NPC lists: humans, dwarves and elves and the dark breeds so i guess that would be the orcs and other monsters they look pretty standard yeah the humans dwarves and elves are very standard fantasy looking and have kind of the the D, &D stats for you know lower charisma higher charisma the code of law oh these are so great Trade laws, chivalric laws, crown laws, keeps and castles, feasts and holidays, the dragon's dance, chivalric games, fool's eve, power and submission, the four factions, the merchants, citadel knights, the arch, arch sorceress, sorcerers, and the guilds of magic. Yeah, so if you want to play in the default setting, yeah, definitely worth uh, so you can give some help, give some flavor to uh, character generation. It will be very useful. So, armed forces, the next, the knights, the tyrolites. Hmm. Yeah. So there's our guild of magic, and then. The Armed Forces, Knights, The Legend of Holds, Citadel, and the Dragon Masters. A lot of fluff. I wasn't, I, yeah, I suspected it sounded like it was um, not so setting dependent, but uh, yeah, there's quite a bit. There's quite a bit in here. Marquis Guards, The Witch Hunters, Life and Death. The Court, The Thieves and Assassins. Traditions and customs, burial, marriage, hospitality. Yeah, so it is. Yeah, it's a medieval Europe feeling, maybe medieval Scandinavia feeling setting. 
Yeah, places and cities in Caldrox. So I hope they do support. Yeah, if they're doing wow, if they're doing this much for a setting, I hope they do support this because there's a lot. There's a lot here in this book. I mean, this is a pretty significant section of the book. Cool, Cordia. Look at that. Sorry, I keep pausing to ogle the illustrations, but I really love. Yeah, I love what they do with these books. Cool aura, die for the black soup. Eldacar, Engine, Aram, Goldberg, The Fighting Pits, Urga, Hef. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, this gives you uh, some good context and ways to set uh, set adventures. This is a lot of, I was much more setting than I anticipated. There was much less, Forbidden Lands had much less, but they seem to front, you know, the um, the choices they made are, oppose or kind of um, subvert a lot of fantasy tropes. This seems very fantasy, but there's a lot of uh, background, a lot of history in the setting and details. The the wars and what happened throughout. Yeah, this is a lot of reading, a lot of setting. Interesting. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't divide this into into smaller, you know, into other books or other references. Wow. Carlo, the North Gate. The Knight Stables, the Three Dragons, the Fighting Roster, the Garrison, the Legend of Astax Blade, Clairval, Clairvox. Great reenactment. Let's see, I think we got past the setting, the Cataclysm, because we're into wars now. Olden, Ferris, Grand Staircase, the Three Barrels, Three Dragons, Three Barrels. The Rose Garden, Pietus, Plavin, the Royal Strategist, Bolton. Wow, there's a lot. There's really a lot in I guess we're going to end on fluff. Yeah, sass. So this is, yeah, this is interesting. I, I wasn't expecting this. I wasn't expecting so much as far as a detail of the setting. And I hope, yeah, I hope that informs the game. I hope there's interesting things because it's a, it's a lot for a, a rune master a game master to have to digest before they run the game and uh yeah surprising but maybe it's just you know it's it's extra and it's there and you don't necessarily have to use it because a single adventure is going to be targeted very specific location and you know a lot of the other surroundings aren't going to come into it wow yeah that is all of their setting and fluff and here are tables. Oh, yeah, so just for animals generating just general creatures, not necessarily monsters. Yeah, that's, that is a lot of settings. So, yeah, the, the end is just going to give us tables for generating giant spiders and goats and swarms of bees. And NPCs, and here is our index. Wow, that's a surprise. Yeah, the amount of lore. I guess I could have learned that from the table of contents, but the uh, amount of lore is very surprising in here. So, yeah, it's a. Uh, what did we end up at? What is that? 280 pages? Yeah, so 280 page book, and a lot of that being lore. So we're looking at, yeah, so the history started at 153, so so less than 300 pages, and halfway through that we are hitting just the the setting itself. That's interesting. That's, a, that's very surprising. So I'm not sure. I mean, there weren't a lot of examples of positioning on a grid, positioning on a hex. They gave us stats for movement in meters and things so it's not a very detailed specific system and as we saw the the pawns themselves don't fit on hexes so hexes are just i think what you're you know you're marking or using to generate the exploration points and and follow your progress and then the actual combat and things are going to be handled on a grid a one inch grid because that's what your pawns are hmm interesting so yeah i'll be curious to go back and go through the details 
of how they want to handle combat because it seemed that stance was very important, but they didn't talk about positioning or flanking or anything. So I'm very uh, I guess interested in how they're going to handle some of this stuff. The things that they're, they're leaving out and the things that they're including are surprising. It's a, it's an interesting combination of uh, what's important and what's unimportant in combat and things. And the fact that they use the exploration points, you know, shows they want you to be, you know, tracking how many hexes you traversed. Uh, yeah. To, uh, because you can spend those, your exploration points are something you can actually spend. They're actually a currency. Wow. Wow. This is very surprising. <laughs> so it, it didn't intrigue me quite the same way that Forbidden Lands did when I was first reading it, because a lot of the, I mean, it didn't go through the setting, granted, but a lot of the things that they did in the details were a little dark and, and strange. And so maybe there is, maybe there is some of that in the uh, uh, the lore and setting, but it looks very standard. It looks very standard as far as the races. The setting may get, push it a little more into dark fantasy or, you know, there may be more of a sense of humor or, or uh, historical reference in uh, in the uh, the setting itself. But this is interesting. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I, I, it's going to take some convincing, I think. <laughs> for me to get a group to try this. I think even much more than Trudvang. And Trudvang, I would definitely want to uh, get uh, our group to play. So this has been Rune Masters. So this was the Adventurer's Pledge, and it came with the box set, as we saw, the adventure booklets, the character pads, the two decks of cards, including stances, and then all of those uh, conditions or buffs are three d10s with a percentile that's you know, the second digit so stands for our pawns are uncut pawns which you know reflect the uh, the art in the book very well but uh, interesting and as you can see and they're not they're card stock but they're not tile stock they're not the the you know layered thick you know kind of piezo style pawns so they'll the big ones will you know sit a little, can get a little curly I'm sure, <laughs> and then the uh, the RM screen the Rune Masters screen, so that was everything in this box set. I am curious I'm really curious about this game and uh, how it will play how it will play and who it will appeal to. I think there's a, an interesting question because there's it's traditional fantasy enough. There's a lot I mean there's there's so much competition in kind of the OSR and traditional fantasy, like scratching certain itches. And uh, I'm curious where what this is kind of aimed at. But I'm glad. I'm glad that it exists, and I'm glad there's a, a, a translation for the uh, English-speaking world, because I, I really uh, am yearning to see more and more of everything that's been hidden you know from us that got developed in the 80s and 90s in Sweden and hasn't hit the English-speaking world yet. So this is just another piece of that puzzle. So this is, yeah, a, a simplified kind of recreation, a celebration of what 80s uh, kind of D10 or D, D100 role play was like. So thank you for joining me. This has been Rune Masters. And uh, please uh, leave a like if you enjoyed this video and take a look at other unboxings and uh, just gaming discussions and actual plays that we have posted on the, uh, the site. So... Uh, Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you want to get notifications of everything. And both a YouTube and Twitch channel have all of our live streams. So anything we do uh, live stream, including our weekly, uh, the weekly kind of catch up on events on tabletop happens every uh, Thursday night, North American time, uh, Friday noon, Friday lunchtime in Japan. <laughs> so thank you for joining me and I will see you next time. This has been Rune Masters. Goodbye.